Members before us, we have Senate File 3319. We have many uh, folks that want to speak on this bill. I would ask members to please write down the questions that you have as we go forward, and we'll let our testifiers testify on the bill, and then we'll have questions afterwards. So, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. 3319, which been, obviously has now been called the Muskie Bill, identified by every everyone that, that's down here, and certainly the muskie enthusiasts as well as other fishermen throughout the state. Senate File 3319 talks about the, and goes, is, is pretty, it's pretty straightforward actually. Uh, it, it talks about the, uh, the ability to, uh, for counties to, to be a, a partic participant in, in the DNR management of the uh, resources, which is what we're talking about today is fishing. So before I comprise that bill, a uh, little bit of the history of the, the Muskie history and my history of Muskie uh, dealings here in the state of Minnesota uh, is that some years ago I, I was contacted uh, as my district changed and I started representing Otter Tail County. Otter Tail County uh, folks were uh, uh, quite concerned about the, the amount of uh, muskie that were being stocked in, in the county had been stocked since uh, 1964 and uh, most recently there was a change in the statute from taking the minimum, minimum stocking size from 48 to uh, 54 inches was a very big concern. But the uh, muskie stocking history on Pelican Lake is since 1964, so it's nearly 30, excuse me, nearly 40 years. Uh, Battle Lake, uh, which is also in Otter Tail County, is uh, 19, so 1979, which is about 35 years. And in, in Minnesota, there are 44 lakes, uh, approximately 44. And I want to say approximate because depending upon where you get your information, but the information I have is off the, the website, DNR website, 44 native lakes. 72 others, so a total of 116 lakes now in Minnesota that are that are uh, stocked with uh, muskie. Um, with the chain of lakes migration, it is estimated that that with with the stocking that's been going on in the past, uh, those years that I've been talking about, the state of Minnesota has is estimated that there's about 40 percent of the acres, the fishable acres in the state of Minnesota, now have muskie. Now, there may be some dispute about that, uh, the, some discussion with the DNR some years ago about whether muskie actually migrate, whether they actually go to a different lake. Uh, I think it's undis I think there's undisputed now. Uh, in fact, personally, I know that's, that's not a fact. Where I live in, in, in Douglas County, where I know fish muskies are actually um, migrating to, uh, to uh, lake downstream from Miltona where there's been intensive muskie stocking for years into Lake Ida where they were relatively large actually 50 50 plus inch muskie actually was seen there uh, by myself that was actually dead floating in the lake so uh, unless somebody came over there that day and actually threw it in front of the uh, the uh, <laughs> environment chair for uh, for my viewing uh, uh, to try and sway me one way or the other which I doubt is very possible uh, I think I'm pretty convinced uh, that uh, that there are muskies now that migrate. So when we talk about 40% of the water, we're talking about 40% of all muskie, uh, excuse me, of all fishable acres. And and I must say that uh, the total percentage of muskie fishermen and women is very low, estimated some somewhere between two and five percent of our total total fishing population. So it's a real it's a real niche sport, and I and I understand that, and I get it. And I understand the excitement that these people have when they catch muskie. Uh, who wouldn't catch, who wouldn't get excited if they caught something over 40 some inches on the end of their line when they were fishing, no matter what they were fishing? Without a doubt, they love the sport and it's a thrill. Any sportsman would love to land, a, again, a 40 to 54 inch fish of any species. Um, there's been discussion and you've gotten these emails with regards to, you know, let the DNR, let the DNR do the science, let the, uh, let the science prevail. And uh, in general thinking, I think most of us do that. Uh, we, we charge the DNR with the, with the responsibility of taking care of our natural resources, uh, whether it be uh, 
cottontail rabbits all the way up to the, to the mighty moose in Minnesota. And lakes are really no different. We, put, we charge them with taking care of those, and, and that's where they get into these issues of, uh, of science as to where should, fish should be stocked and where they shouldn't be stocked and how many should be stocked. And so I understand that concept, but I need, to, I need to emphasize to the committee here tonight that not, not always is it agreed upon by the social, by the, by the folks out there that actually pay the bills. That's yours and my constituents. They don't always agree with it. I'll give you one case in point, uh, the whitetail study that was done in Senator Senjum's district, I believe, uh, uh, just some recent years ago. Uh, where there was a group of, of uh, whitetail enthusiasts down there that said we should really have a four-point restriction statewide, and and uh, I think there was a lot there was a lot of discussion going on at that time, and and so we we with the with the DNR agreed that we would go a three-year study of whitetail four-point restriction on the southeast part of the state of Minnesota. Uh, we we actually accomplished that, and we accomplished a couple of different things. We certainly got bigger deer, bigger uh, experiences for for a larger buck. And, uh, but now, however, we're finding out that not just should we be shooting that bigger deer, but maybe we should be also allowing or at least encouraging younger deer to be shot because quite frankly, they're, the science is now showing that they're, they're more prevalent to carrying the CWD that now has been infecting some of our, some of our whitetail. So my point that I'm making here is, is that uh, when, when some people come to the legislature uh, we don't necessarily always agree with the DNR. We do, uh, we do go ahead and do do some of the things that 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 uh, whether they be right or wrong, we do go ahead and do these types of studies. Um, stocking it, it, and then taking of muskies in a metro area. I know, and I'm going to speak a little bit out of out of school. I know the muskie is a different different breed in, in the metro area. There might be more than one, but I know that's a smaller strain of muskie. They also, and I think, Madam Chair, you even mentioned it earlier today, that they actually die of old age. Uh, they don't get any bigger than, than, than 40 inches. I know that might be the, the, the musking opportunity here in the metro. I think there's four or five lakes that have those tiger muskies. But we have a larger strain of muskie that's been, that's been stocked in, in, I think they call it the Mississippi strain, and again, I'm going to be going out on the limb uh, calling it that, but nevertheless, it's a much larger fish that has been that the DNR has been stocking. Um, when we talk about science and where the legislature should always follow it, I want to point this out as well. Uh, there's been a lot of studies with muskies uh, over the years. They're very expensive studies. Um, but I do remember very, very clearly for maybe five years ago when, when the legislature stepped in and the DNR was actually uh, giving their report in the, uh, uh, in the committee that I was on, and Madam Chair, I think you were there as well, where there was discussion as to uh, the, how the program was going, and it was, it was a real positive thing the way I understand it, the way I remember it, and the DNR said that it was time for us to move forward and offer a larger fish uh, for a minimum size, go from 48 to 50 inches. And to make a short story long here, the legislature took it upon themselves, whether it was right or wrong, um, actually raised the, the minimum limit to 54 inches. So that was a six inch limit, six inch increase in one, one year. Uh, once again, pointing out the fact that not always does the science dictate, not always does the, uh, the, does the legislature follow the science. In that particular case, they didn't. And we now have a, a larger, larger opportunity, larger fish opportunity uh, with a 54-inch. Um, and I must, must tell you that all the studies that were done before, at least that I know of, that I'm aware of, and there's been several, not once has there been a study on a 54-inch minimum muskie. In other words, what does that do to the ecosystem? What does it do to the, to the other fish population? That particular study has not been done. That's part of the reason that I'm here. Um, muskies have many different diets, and you have this, this, some of this information in your packet. Uh, many people claim that muskies do not eat walleyes. However, it's not true. The DNR website will tell you that. 
Uh, another testifier may, may talk about this later, but there, there's, a, there's three different studies where it's very clear on the Lake Mille Lacs Lake where uh, if you have one fish, uh, every, as the DNR claims, every 50 acres, they're going to consume a certain amount of fish, and a part, and the part and parcel of those fish consumed are going to be walleyes. And, and he'll come forward, I think, with some of that uh, testimony later. Um, the study in this bill... Um, again, I, I'm referring to the 54-inch, the there not being one, um, and stocking of lakes continue to go on and on and on. And, and uh, so I think what, what I, the most recent thing that I've been thinking about and, and, is, and I've had a, given this a lot of thought as to why I would be jumping in with this very, con it turns out to be somewhat controversial issue, is that I think, along with a lot of people in my district uh, and, and a lot of people throughout the state of Minnesota, think that maybe the DNR should be taking their focus towards, towards the state fish and, and uh, putting more towards stocking walleyes uh, instead of uh, any more muskies, because we have tremendous opportunities for, for muskie uh, taken the state of Minnesota, and uh, I happen to agree that I think our state fish is important. People come to the lake, uh, they come up there to, to tube and come up there to swim, and if they can go back, go back home and say they spent a lot of time on the lake and they had some fresh fish, uh, that might be a northern pike, it might be some sunfish, it might be crappie, and, and it'd be a real bonus if it was one or two walleyes. Uh, folks, I don't think we're, we're a walleye destination like we used to be or like we actually should be and could be if the DNR were to pay more attention to stocking walleye and less attention on, on stocking, uh, uh, continuously stocking and, and creating more acres of, of uh, musky waters. So that's the, that's the agreement, uh, the disagreement that I have with, with, uh, with some folks. And with that, I have some testifiers and I... I I guess I can ramble for a long time, but we don't have a long time, and I'd like to sooner have these testifiers talk, and because they've come a long distance and uh, stand for any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, who would like to go first, Mr. Sprack? Please identify yourself for the tape. Madam Chair, members, uh, Tim Sprack. I'm speaking today for the interests of two different organizations. One is the Minnesota Dark House and Angling Association and the other is the Minnesotans for Family Fishing and Healthy Lakes. I'm going to address the bill on behalf of the Dark House folks, and there is a large group of people that will follow Mr. Forrester, as many as we can get in today, that will speak for Minnesotans for Family Fishing. Minnesota Dark House Association supports this bill. Um, it's been an ongoing concern of theirs for a number of reasons, most of which Mr. Uh, Ingebrigtsen or Senator Ingebrigtsen just mentioned. My job today is to present their position and let you know that there are several thousand members in this organization alone. And some of you have been concerned that you've been getting inundated with emails and phone calls from the opposition. But please understand that just because our people are not particularly savvy with regard to social media and email, that they are not out there and that they're not engaged. And they have sent me down here for that reason. And today I'm here to support this bill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Forrester, um, please state your name for the record. Um, yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jeff Forrester. I'm Executive Director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Um, our membership includes lake association, lake home and cabin owners, resort and marina owners, local businesses, faith leaders, as well as a number of water professionals. Uh, Everyone in this room has the same fundamental goal, healthy and vibrant aquatic ecosystems. Yet there's this division. The current stakeholder engagement process as outlined in the long range plan is inadequate and this conflict is but the latest example. This issue should never reach the level of the legislature or even the county board. Minnesota's lake home and cabin owners are anglers. 62% of them buy a fishing license and an average of four visitors to their lake places buy a fishing license each year, totaling more than 500,000 licenses sold annually. Collectively, the more than 500 lake associations spend almost $400,000 a year on fish stocking. In some areas of the state, with some of our members, 
The muskie fishery is vital to the local economy and is enjoyed by visitors and residents alike. In other areas with different economic landscapes, there is opposition to the expansion of muskies. Some of our resort members depend on muskie fishing for late, late season revenue. Others do not cater to muskie anglers and are unaffected. None of them are working to shut the public off the waters. Finding a way to leverage their energy and commitment is critically important to improving water quality, aquatic habitat, and fishing opportunities. Yet according to a study last year by Concordia College, and I quote, the majority of the respondents do not agree that their lake association is authentically included in the lake planning process. And I think that is a, a critical piece of information as to why we're here today and why this is such a, 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 an issue. Minnesota needs a better model to build partnerships between the Minnesota DNR and communities to reach our natural resource goals. Science must drive our natural resource decisions. It is time to take another look at the potential impacts of muskies on other, and on other fisheries. A lot has changed since 2008 when the long range plan was adopted. Increase in size limit for muskie from 40 to 48 and then to 54. The infestation of zebra mussels into many uh, prime muskie lakes like Mille Lacs, which have changed not only food webs, but water clarity and plant distribution. Spiny water flea, which is having significant impacts on food web processes, and now starry stonewort, which will impact not only navigation, but fish spawning areas. Significant rain events have increased, as has water temperature and changes to ice in and ice out dates. 2008, the year that the long range plan was written, was the year that the iPhone was released. It feels like a century ago in terms of scientific advancement since then. It almost is. New and developing computer models, eDNA technology, and other adva advancements provide far more capacity. As a result of new data, resource management is moving away from the single species focus, a focus often driven by special interest groups, to a holistic adaptive management approach that tries to account for the many changing variables, some of which are beyond our control in our systems today. Thank you for your time and for allowing me to present on behalf of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Uh, if we ever hope to reverse the disturbing trends like the collapse of Mille Lacs fishery and others, we need independent science devoid of special interests and a public-private partnership process that resolves conflict instead of igniting it. Thank you. Would you uh, please state your name for the record, please? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, James Anderson. Um, Good afternoon or evening. Um, I am a, <clears throat> and my family have been uh, property owners on Gull Lake uh, in Nisswa, Minnesota, both in Cass and Crow Wing County. It's split between the two counties. We've been residents off and on the lake for over 60 years there. Um, we, we were, uh, I, the reason I'm here is really to point out uh, the lack of due process that we feel uh, was received in the uh, process with the Department of Natural Resources when the uh, DNR stocked uh, Gull Lake with muskies back in the fall of 2016. Uh, there's, a, I believe you have a report there, a, a folder or uh, ring binder that uh, on page 31 and 32 shows the history of what went on at Gull Lake. Um, it was our feeling that Gull Lake was not a native lake because it was not listed in the DNR 2020 uh, report. It was not listed as a native lake. Um, DNR in about 2008 proposed to stock the lake. In 2009, the DNR backed off, decided not to do that for whatever reason. Probably there was some opposition and I'm not exactly sure why they did. Um, in October 2015, uh, the DNR started talking about it again in the Gull Chain of Lakes Association, did a survey of its members that came back with 70 against stocking, 8 neutral, and 22 uh, for it. So it was an uh, overwhelming majority of the lake shore holders did not, and owners did not want the um, stocking to occur. Um, the DNR uh, pretty much did not pay any attention to the hat, and in July 26th, approximately 2016, the DNR announced it was going to stock muskies in Gull Lake. Um, I'm also an attorney, and when I heard about this, I <clears throat> suggested to local residents and others that uh, 
the only way we could get a, to do anything was to file a petition for an EAW. Uh, we raised over 300 signatures from not just Gull Lake property owners, but also people who vacation in that area, stay at resorts, and uh, so that list included a lot of people from outside the area that signed the petition. We raised the funds, hired an environmental attorney, and filed a petition for an EAW. That was August 31st, 2016. Uh, September 7th, uh, about a week later, the EQB appointed the DNR as the responsible agency, which to me, I felt that that was the old saying, fox guarding the chicken coop, DNR was going to make this decision, and yet they're the ones to decide on whether an environmental impact statement was necessary. Um, October 3rd, shortly thereafter, the DNR requested a 15-day extension, which is certainly all legal. Um, on October 7th, a Friday, this is uh, approximately 60 days after the petition is filed, not even that long, um, October 7th, it was a Friday afternoon, DNR sent an email at 3.18 p.m. to our attorney saying that they decided that, that uh, that uh, no EAW is necessary, no EIS, um, and within three hours they put the uh, muskies' fingerlings into Gull Lake. There was absolutely no chance for us to even review their decision. There was no opportunity to appeal uh, to the courts, which I believe is a very important part of the, uh, the process. And while I can't say anything was illegal, I think there was a real lack of due process and transparency on the behalf of the uh, DNR. Um, our group got back together and decided that rather than appeal something that's already taken place, our focus was way better to come here to the legislature where we felt we would and feel that we will get uh, the due process that we wanted and the study that's necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, my name is Harry Miracle. I live in the city of Battle Lake and where West Battle Lake is. And I'm here to tell you today that we have a serious musky problem on West Battle Lake that needs to be addressed immediately. I fish on that lake a minimum of 150 days out of the year. And I'm not here to blow smoke up anywhere. I'm just here to tell you the truth and what's going on. In the last five years, I have caught over 30 muskies, the smallest being 40 inches, the biggest about 51. These fish are 30 pounds, 35 pounds, some of them, the bigger ones are. They eat, they eat muskies. They eat everything in the lake. In, the, uh, in this winter, for example, I was in a fish house, two different fish houses at two different times, and I had three 26 inch walleyes come up. And I have pictures of these walleyes on my phone. I'd be happy to share with you. They were half eaten. And there's only one thing in that lake that is eating those walleyes. 26 inch, that's a seven pound walleye. People would mount those walleyes, half eaten. Then they're eaten by muskies. That's where we've gotten to now. These things are just taking over. And I'm just questioning you know, the, the capability of the DNR to truly manage this process right now. You could come to Napanee Bay and I'd be happy to take any of you people out there in the spring of the year two weeks after the ice goes out, and I will show you in excess of over 100 muskies right there in Napanee Bay getting ready to spawn. And then we're gonna add more to it. The muskies are at 2,002 low levels. Find me a white sucker, find me a tulipy, find me a white fish. These things are, these fish are gone. We are not catching them anymore. And furthermore, in the latest outdoor news, it stated that our Lakeshore Association approved the, the stocking of these muskies. Well, that's not true either. It is not true. They have never voted on it in the 18 years that I have lived there. And the city of Battle Lake recently voted with a number of townships in the area to support the county commissioners that have said we need to, and, and Senator Bill Engelbritson to stop this madness until we get some real scientific data on, this, on the, on the long-term problem that these muskies are causing because it's not going to go away. Thank you. Madam Chair and other committee members, my name is Teresa Whitman. My family has owned a cabin on Gull Lake since 1958. I learned to swim, ski, sail, and fish on the lake, as did my children. 
I want my grandchildren to also enjoy water activities without fearing fierce predator fish lurking in the waters. I speak for all the mothers, fathers, grandparents, and children that I know. Muskies are not a native species to the Gull Lake chain of lakes, and we do not want muskies in these lakes. We do not want to swim with four foot long fish with razor teeth. Gull Lake and other non-native lakes are in crisis because of zebra mussels, milfoil, and other invasive species. Native snails, clams, weeds have almost completely disappeared. Fishermen complain that they are catching fewer walleye. Already crippled ecosystems should not be further stressed with yet another invasive species. We want the DNR to immediately stop stocking lakes and waterways where muskies are not naturally occurring. Gull Lake is a densely populated, highly used recreational lake. It has always been family-centric, and it was formerly renowned as a walleye lake. To stock the lake with muskies is dangerous, irresponsible, and a misuse of resources and taxpayer money. Last year, the DNR spent $1.2 million on muskies. Why? Why isn't that money being used to rid our lakes of zebra mussels, milfoil, and other invasive species and to prevent further spreading of these invasive species? Why isn't taxpayer money being used to restore the water quality of our lakes, the diversity of our lake ecosystems, and to restock and restore the much desired walleye? My husband and son-in-law love to fish, and they want to catch walleye, sunnies, and other panfish that they can safely catch and eat not a fierce muskie that is not good eating because it has too many bones and high mercury levels. We do not want the walleye in Gull Lake to compete with muskies. We do not want muskies eating walleye and other fish. Muskies are voracious eaters with enormous mouths and long razor teeth. Ambush predators, they attack loon chicks, ducklings, fish, and other lake mammals. The loon population needs to be supported. We do not want muskies, yet another threat to loons in non-native lakes. The DNR is supposed to be working for all Minnesotans, not for Muskies, Inc. Yet on October 7, 2016, as already mentioned, as we were waiting for a response from the Minnesota DNR to do an environmental assessment, we learned that the DNR had already stopped Gull Lake with muskies, notifying us after the fact and leaving no room for appeal in spite of overwhelming opposition. Why? Why was this done? The DNR is charged with preserving our lakes. Please stop spending our tax dollars stocking muskies in lakes that are not naturally occurring. Preserve Gull Lake and other non-native lakes as family-centric walleye lakes. Please approve this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Welcome. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Eric Lohman and I'm representing the Waterville Lakes Association in Waterville, Minnesota, which represents around 600 lakeshore owners on Lakes Titanka, Upper Cicada, and Lower Cicada, the vast majority of whom are against designating Lake Titanka as a muskie lake. Lake Titanka is part of a nine lake chain on the Cannon River. The DNR contends that the muskies would stay in Titanka, but of course, locals are skeptical of that. The Lake Association's main concern is that the increase in boat traffic from other muskie lakes will introduce invasive species, which we have been diligently fighting with watercraft inspections at our two launches for over 10 years now. So far, we have found and avoided the introduction of zebra mussels and Eurasian milfoil. Luke Skinner, formerly the supervisor of the DNR Invasive Species Program at one of the local, lake, local stakeholder meetings, when asked a question, said, yes, certainly, the risk of introducing invasive species increased with more boat traffic from lake to lake. Many other local groups oppose this from a fishery standpoint and feel that the introduction of muskies would have a huge effect on our present fishery. These are some of the groups and organizations in our area that adamantly oppose the designation of Lake Tiptonka as a musky lake. The Waterville Lakes Association, the City of Waterville, the Lesseur County Board of Commissioners, the Waterville Sportsman's Club, 
the Southern Minnesota chapter of and the Minnesota Dark House and Anglers Association, the Cannon River Watershed Partnership, the Waterville Chamber of Commerce, uh, some of our representatives and senators, and many others. Despite this obvious lack of support for Muskie introduction in Titanka, the DNR continues to push their agenda regardless of local opinion. We understand that our lakes are a public resource and they belong to everyone, but why should the DNR try so hard to appease an admittedly small percentage of the fishing public at such a great expense? In conclusion, I saw on the DNR website that a southern Minnesota lake such as Tetonka in Lesueur County, and they actually listed Tetonka, produces about 40 pounds of game fish per acre. According to Inn Fisherman, a 54-inch muskie weighs 33 to 38 pounds. A 12-inch crappie weighs 9 tenths of a pound, and a 10-inch bluegill weighs 8 tenths of a pound. I ask you, what would the great majority of Minnesota anglers like to catch? 40 pounds of panfish or one muskie that you release? This bill would help bring these kinds of decisions back to the local level where I think it belongs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi. Hello, Madam Chair and Representatives. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my testimony. I'm Steve Frawley. I live on the Gull Lake chain. And uh, I want to spend just a few moments talking about a, a very important topic here that's important today. And that is simply that I believe there's no need for non-native lakes to be stocked. And here's why. And I'm going to be referring to several points in your booklets on page four if you want to look at some of the details on this later. But uh, my first point is in 2008, the Minnesota DNR put together the, what they call the 2020 plan that stated that 44 native lakes and eight rivers existed for muskie. This represents 21% of the fishable water surface, not including all river acreage. The stocking of non-native lakes, of which there are about 60, puts total fishable acreage at 35%. And this number doesn't include uh, chain lakes. Uh, for example, uh, I live on the chain, Gull Chain. There's Gull Lake and there are seven lakes that are all interconnected. So muskie fry that are placed in a Gull Lake, a non-native lake, end up in my lake also, an another one of the seven other non-native lakes as part of the Gull Lake ecosystem. And that doesn't include other migration lakes or lakes on rivers. So that 35% is probably closer to 40% of totable, total fishable acreage for muskie fishing. The Minnesota DNR makes claims of up to 300,000 muskie fishermen, saying it's the fastest growing, etc. The actual numbers are unknown, but the most reliable estimates are less than 2% of total resident Minnesota taxpayers that actually fish for muskies. The latest Minnesota DNR uh, survey, it was paid for, but it has not been circulated. It's called the 2015 Schroeder Study, shows that muskie fishing is in 13th place when looking at all other fish species, 13th. Uh, the words that you often hear from different organizations, oh, it's the second, it's the sixth largest, fastest growing, most popular fish. It's actually 13th, according to this study. Yet, the important thing to remember is DNR spending on muskies is the third highest. So, of all fish, it's, no, it's number three. So that, I guess in summary, millions of dollars are currently being spent on expensive uh, stocking of muskies, which are non-native fish. I'd like to see that changed. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Welcome okay. to the committee. Please state your Madam name Chair, for the record. Committee members, uh, I'm Bernie Steves. I'm from Otter Tail Lake, and in, in uh, Otter Tail Lake is in Otter Tail County. And I serve on the Otter Tail Lake Association, Otter Tail COLA, Otter Tail County AIS Task Force, which I am chair. Uh, we do not have many people here today expressing their concerns because they rely on us to represent them, and that's what we're doing here today. Our Lake Association has about 1,700 residents. The association, at its annual meeting, voted 99% against the introduction 
of muskies into our five lakes and the one river that we represent. And uh, we also, following that, we did an email survey to find out, make sure that this survey was correct. So we not only did it at our annual meeting, we also did it at our board meeting and followed up with emails. We are not here to suggest that we eliminate muskies from our Minnesota lakes. Non-native lakes do not need the introduction of muskies. The introduction of the new species without proper review is not good for the future of our lakes. We have plenty of lakes in Minnesota for muskie fishing. We encourage you to support this bill, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I believe next up we have uh, Aaron Meyer. Is that correct? Madam Chair. Senators. I, I think that might be the ones that are in favor of the bill. Uh, the ones that are not or want to speak otherwise are, are not next here. And, and I have the list as well. Bern Wagner, um, Greg. Yeah, Greg Qualley, I think we'll just Aaron go. Meyer. Yeah, Senator, Senator Ingebrigtsen, if we could just maybe go in order from the list sure. we have, it'd be great. Yep. So I think the next on the list is Aaron Meyer. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Aaron Meyer. I'm the co-chair of the Minnesota Muskie and Pike Alliance, and I'm here to speak in opposition to Senate File 3319. Um, I have three main topic points that I'll, I'll try to move through relatively quickly. Uh, we're hearing some other uh, lakes brought up this evening, um, but the center of this controversy has been around Pelican Lake in Otter Tail County, and uh, claims made by the Pelican Lake Property Owners Association about harm caused by muskies, and then this has kind of spread and moved to, to some of these other lakes that have been brought up this evening. Uh, muskies have been stocked in Pelican Lake for about 40 years, that was already uh, mentioned. Um, the average walleye, perch, and bluegill abundance is higher now than ever before muskies were stocked. Uh, walleye catch rates have been above average and climbing for the last 16 years, every year. Pelican Lake has among the highest walleye catch rates in all of Otter Tail County, and Otter Tail County has more lakes than any other county in Minnesota, so that's saying something. Uh, yellow perch are the primary prey species, and they're also currently at an all-time high. Blue, excuse me, bluegill abundance is increasing. The northern pike population is better stabilized and balanced than ever before, meaning uh, fewer small fish and more of the average size nice pike. Um, the black crappie population also compares favorably to other types of lakes in the area. <clears throat> uh, my, my second point, uh, revolves around some of the uh, the impacts and the the uh, supporters' statements as to these impacts on on various lakes. Um, they will at times uh, try to claim actual data, and they'll cite certain reports, certain uh, uh, studies. Uh, mainly, there's one called the Kerr Report, and that was the uh, the author of that report. Uh, the Kerr Report compiles musky data from all across the United States and Canada. By my count, um, I've got parts of it here. It cites 147 different studies and documents by several hundred biologists, and its summary states, quote, there's very little evidence to indicate that muskellunge have a significant impact on populations of other popular species, including walleye and bass. Now that's the summary after 147 different studies have been compiled. Um, and contrary to what we've heard here tonight, this, this same study also cites, uh, excuse me, cites um, the study of all 41 stocked musky lakes in Minnesota, with data going back since before they were stocked. Um, it shows no decrease in any abundance of any species, including walleyes, after muskies were stocked. Now that's the data from right here in Minnesota. That's the lakes we're talking about tonight. Um, some of the examples they use actually are coming out of Wisconsin, and the fisheries supervisor there sent a letter to the state of Minnesota stating, quote, 
a small group of Minnesota residents is misusing Wisconsin data by pulling it out of context and using it to support an agenda that few, if any, professional biologists in North America would support, end quote. <clears throat> um, another another uh, study that they, uh, they will cite comes out of Iron Lake, Michigan. Um, basically, there's one line in this, this Kerr report that, that brings up this lake and talks about how many walleyes it's possible for muskies to potentially eat in this lake. Uh, the actual author of that study states, and I quote, I created a model simulating a high density muskie population consuming the maximum possible percentage of walleyes. So it's simply a model, it's not even actual data. Uh, <clears throat> by comparison, um, the Minnesota DNR con uh, considers one muskie per four acres of water to be on the high end of what we manage for. Pelican Lake is estimated at one muskie per 19 acres. The lake in this Michigan study had three muskies per one acre. I mean, it's, it's dozens of times higher, and it was uh, art artificially and intentionally done just to uh, test what could happen. And uh, my last point for the evening is the social consideration of this. Musky fishing doesn't take anything away from anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't prevent anybody from going out and enjoying whatever other species they like, whether it's panfish, walleyes, bass. We all have the same opportunities, whether muskies are there or they're not. The other fish are still there, and the data proves it. Um, it simply creates another opportunity for people to go fishing, get families together, uh, it's another thing we'll hear about that, you know, it's not a family sport. Every person I know that musky fishes does it with their family. I've had a seven-year-old girl catch a fish in my boat before. It's not taking family fishing away. Um, as Minnesotans, we passed a constitutional amendment to protect our hunting and fishing heritage. More walleyes are stocked into non-native waters in Minnesota than other, any other species. Taking musky stocking away would only hurt our outdoor heritage the same way that taking walleye stocking would. That wouldn't be good for anybody. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, please vote against this bill and any other bill that includes a moratorium on musky stocking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I believe we have uh, Mr. Lindbergh, and if we could also have Mr. Wagner come up so we can... Uh, and maybe two at a time. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thanks. Uh, my name is Grant Limberg from Cambridge, Minnesota, and I'm here to testify in opposition to SF 3319. The, the committee is going to receive a lot of testimony today about why this bill is bad from a public policy standpoint and why this bill is bad from an access to public water standpoint. But I'm here to talk today about why muskie fishing actually is a family sport. Um, I have two boys who are ages six and nine. Um, I'm not normally inclined to get in political matters, but I believe every single provision of this bill is so bad that it motivated me to come down here today. Muskie fishing has become a tradition in my family with many happy moments. I have a brother-in-law who lives in Florida who flies up every year to fish in Minnesota on a muskie fishing trip. I was lucky to spend many years in the boat with my dad who passed away a couple years ago, and I want to make sure that my kids have the opportunity to spend the days in the boat with me for the rest of their lives. So today I'm not here necessarily to protect the resource just for myself, but I'm here for my kids because I believe it's our obligation to leave this resource in a better condition for our children than it was when we received it. Musky fishing is an excellent way to teach my boys many of life's lessons. It teaches them that things don't always come easy and sometimes you have to work very hard and be patient in order to obtain the desired results. It also teaches them that things don't necessarily always happen how you want them to because there's many days where you go fishing and you simply don't catch a fish but those days are just as important as the days you do catch a fish because it teaches them not to give up, to get up the next day and try again and keep working hard. 
These life skills, I firmly believe, will transfer into the rest of their lives. I want my kids to be hardworking, patient, determined, and value time with their families in the great outdoors, and I firmly believe muskie fishing is a great avenue to provide that. So I'm asking you, when you to consider this bill, to please vote no, to get, no against it. Every single provision in this bill is a detriment to the natural resource and the decades of hard work, for the DN, that the, hard work that the DNR has put into the fishery in the state of Minnesota. And so this legislation is bad public policy all around, and I thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wagner, yes. welcome. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Vern Wagner. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, we are uh, I pr vice president of a group called Anglers for Habitat, and our goal is to bring the angler's voice to uh, issues that concern angling. <laughs> so, so this concerns angling, so uh, I'd like to address you all. First of all, I'd like to thank, though, Senator Ingebrigtsen for bringing um, the local voices forward. I think we need more of that. I mean, I, that's, you just got to love democracy <laughs> in, in, in the process and, and, and seeing it work here. Aaron stole most of my presentation um, because I was going to talk about um, if muskies um, or any species are so uh, uh, dangerous or negative to a lake, why does Pelican Lake show such a positive uh, growth in uh, walleyes? Why is the sunfish and bluegill population so good in that lake? Um, what is it that perch um, are thriving? Um, how, how do you explain that after hearing uh, testifier after testifier saying that their lake is going to be decimated if we put muskies in it. The broader issue that really brought me here is one, one that is in this bill, and it's about transferring um, control of fish stocking and fish management to uh, local entities and lakeshore associations. And I'm not opposed to um, having those voices be heard more. Um, matter of fact, I think what this whole bill illustrates is the uh, schism between uh, lake associations, cabin owners, and anglers. Uh, we seem to always end up on the opposite side of issues, and that just doesn't make any sense. We oppose the bill, and we primarily oppose the, the idea of taking uh, the control away from the DNR and putting it in the hands of uh, lakeshore uh, associations, county boards, uh, local colas, they belong in the conversation. So I would like to come here and support a bill someday that brings those voices together. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Kowali and Mr. Ness. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. Madam Chairman, members of the, of the uh, committee, my name is Greg Qualley. I'm from uh, Brainerd, Minnesota, and I am here actually representing the Minnesota Muskie and Pike Alliance. And I'm going to try to keep my comments to, to two minutes. I thought that was, was the rules. <laughs> so anyhow, um, a couple things. First of all, um, it, it seems every year there's some sort of muskie legislation introduced. And I know Senator Engelbretson feels uh, very strongly about it. Um, it. It also brings out a lot of emotion on both sides of this particular issue. And uh, it also brings out a, 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 a minority of people that hate muskies. And that's basically what some of this legislation is doing. It's actually anti-muskie hate legislation, and I hate to see it. It's not a good thing. It also is directing uh, the Department of Natural Resources to turn over management of the resource to a, a, uh, a local agency, a local unit of government. 
Um, we don't do business that way in, in Minnesota. We never have. Um, I've been part of the, uh, the uh, committee, the DNR committee. It's a citizen committee, input committee on fisheries management, primarily muskies and pike. I've been there for close to 15 years. And I have to admit that going into it, I was very skeptical about, about the management of the, of, of the resource. We've worked with the DNR for 10, 10 years on this 2020 plan. It was very well thought out uh, and, and, and implemented very well. The Department of Natural Resources is doing a very good job with muskie management. This community communicates extensively with the other species specific com committees, uh, such as the walleye, the pa uh, bass, and the panfish committees. And there's really no argument among any citizens on those committees as to the effect that muskies have on other fish in fish communities. And the last point I'd, I'd, I'd like to make, and uh, it's, I don't know quite how to state this in a diplomatic fashion. I, I might not have done it originally, um, but but I'm sorry, go Senator. Ahead, I, can't, I can't I can't su I can't support this legislation. It's just it's it's uh, it's not good legislation. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Lance Ness. I'm president of several groups. Vern spoke for Anglers for Habitat. I'm president of that group, president of another group called the Minnesota Conservation Federation, and also president of the Fish and Wildlife Legislative Alliance, who I'll be speaking for uh, this evening. Uh, one of our key members is the American Fishery Society. These are the professionals, scientists, biologists, uh, water managers that work for not only DNR, but uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and other, other folks. Um, they're science-based. Yeah, we have a letter before you um, based on science. We believe that's how the decision should be made. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to Senate File 3319 and thank Senator Ingebrigtsen for his interest in the subject. This is a controversial issue and one that should be solved not by emotion, but by science. We cannot support the bill as introduced. The only portion we could consider, possibly consider, is if there is a scientific reason for further study of the impact of muskies on other species. And we question whether or not even the $50,000 is enough money for a study. So we cannot uh, support Senate File 3319. I could talk further and longer, but in the interest of time, Madam Chair, I told to keep my remarks brief. But I do want to encourage you to think of the science that needs to be involved here and not the emotion. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, I think we have um, Mr. Meyer from the DNR to comment on the bill. Welcome. Please state your name for the record. Madam Chair, members of the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources, and thank you for the time. You know, I had a bunch of comments prepared. I had a long PowerPoint presentation, but in the interest of time, we've talked about this issue many times before within the legislature. Obviously, I can go section by section, Mr. Ness's and, and others' comments about county stocking resolutions. I know there's a lot of discussion about local control in the legislature right now, what some local governments want to be able to make decisions on. This, it, just put it right in that conversation as well. Having local units of government or county boards tell the state how to manage the public waters. We just can't support, don't want to go down that road. It just doesn't make any sense. The scientists, the science that we use, the information that we have, uh, working with the stakeholders of the state, the citizens of the state, not only the, the, the fishermen, but also property owners, people who live on these lakes. We talk with all of these people, make our decisions, so some people may not feel that way. Um, you know, we've already, committed to not stocking any new waters. We want to continue stocking the waters that we are at the current rates. We feel our stocking levels are very low compared to our other states. So I, I could go on and on, Madam Chair. We oppose the language as written um, just for the number of concerns that you've heard already tonight, and I'll just stand for question. Thank you. Members, are there questions for Senator Ingebrigtsen or the DNR? 
Senator Eichhorn. Not so much as a question as a few comments and, and maybe an amendment here. First of all, Senator Engelbertson, I'd like to thank you for, for bringing this bill forward. Sometimes it's, it's extremely important just to have the conversation, and I appreciate you bringing this forward to have the conversation today. Um, I understand the concerns of, of, of both your, your community members that have come, and, and I've, I have many of my own community members that, that unfortunately share the concerns of the people that are opposing your bill. But there is one part of this bill that I think is really good, and I think that's the part to study it. I think that's, it, it's always important to do that, and I see you've got the, the university doing that, and I think that's an important part. Um, my, my community members are concerned about allowing the counties to do uh, some of the stocking resolutions because they're not necessarily as prepared as the DNR uh, to make some of those decisions. The DNR has a really good handle on, I, I think, on some of the stocking, so I think that there's some concern there. Also with the size limits. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd kind of like to offer an amendment that gets rid of a lot of the bill, unfortunately, but I still think it leaves the part that that's important for your communities and to still do that study. So, and I'll see if Mr. Knopf can maybe help me, but I think uh, it would be important to delete sections one through six. We can still leave section seven in there so that your affected communities can still move forward. We can still do the study, um, but I think it would alleviate some of the con concerns on the short term and then uh, going forward based on what that study comes out with, maybe we can move forward with some of those other provisions in the future, but I think that would alleviate a lot of concerns, at least that my constituents have at this point in time. Senator Knopp, could you reiterate the, <laughs> the uh, amendment for the members, please? Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, be uh, page one, delete section one, delete section two, Page two, delete section three, delete section four, section five, and section six, and that would leave section seven um, with the, the moratorium on, for Otter Tail County, the study of Otter Tail, and the study of Otter Tail County. But the moratorium is only effective if the Otter Tail County Board of Commissioners um, uh, basically uh, approve it through resolution. Thank you. Members, are there questions? Senator Eaton. Madam Chair, I'm wondering if I might ask a question of um, Mr. Myers from the DNR. Mr. Meyer. Thank you. Senator Eaton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Meyer, has this study been done recently that is being requested here. Um, the information I have that there's been considerable amount of studies and that there's um, really no good reason to do another one, but I would like to hear it from the DNR if you could. Mr. Meyer. Madam Chair, Senator Eaton, there have been a number of studies that have taken place. One of our concerns would be, and I think the study would come up with the same things that some of the testifiers already spoke of. One of the concerns with this language would be the university most likely would need some information from us. So the language says a study must be conducted independently of the Department of Natural Resources. So I don't know where they would get that money from. So that's one of the concerns. Um, and we just question whether what they will come up with is anything new or not. Thank you. Senator Dean. Senator Sengem. Uh Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And. Uh, I'm not sure. With respect to the motion, I, I'll just go right at it. Uh, I think I heard Mr. Myers that uh, you indicated that you do not plan to introduce muskies into lakes that uh, that aren't that aren't musky lakes, if you will. And so I'm looking at Section One, and and if that's really true, uh, what? Uh, why wouldn't we leave that in there? I guess that's not for you to answer. That's for us to answer. But. Uh, I guess that's that's my comment uh, with respect to the to the motion at this point. Well, maybe I could just ask: Is it is it true that you're not going to introduce muskies into lakes that you Madam have not Chair. before? Senator, Mr. Meyer. I'm sorry, Senator Sanjum. I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I'm referencing as I asked my question, section one, where it talks about uh, introducing muskies into additional waters not previously stocked with muskies. And uh, I think I heard you say that you, you don't plan to do that anyway. 
Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Sanjim, Commissioner Landwehr has communicated this in person with Senator Ingebrigtsen as well, but our intention is not to introduce muskies into any new water bodies that we're currently not stocking. The language in Senator Eichhorn's amendment that would basically just keep Section 7 in the bill would impact the stocking programs in three water bodies that I think people have talked about right now, West Battle, uh, Otter Tail, and Pelican. Um, uh, Pelican, West Battle, and what's the other one I had? There are the three lakes in Otter Tail County that we're currently stocking. Mm -hmm. So Beers Lake, which is totally within the state park boundary. So that would put a stop to our stocking program in those three lakes for three years, which would interrupt that stocking cycle and that stocking program. The, the language in section one, the only thing that I would have to say to add to that would be you know, next year there will be a new commissioner probably most likely at the Department of Natural Resources, so this would impact that next administration's decision-making authority as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Dibble? No? Members, are there any other questions? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, to that point, Senator Senjum, uh, I did receive that letter from, from uh, uh, Commissioner Land were saying that he was not going to, the, the DNR would, would uh, stop stocking any lakes, uh, excuse me, any additional lakes. And, you know, I, I'm going to certainly take him at his, at his word, but as, as the Deputy Commissioner is talking about, that could change over, over the year. Um, but I must remember, remind folks, if you look on, and I don't, I don't think necessarily this is a bad amendment. We're talking about the amendment, but being we're kind of wandering off. If you look at the native range of muskies in your booklet, you'll notice that that's the, that comes from the USGA that we utilize all the time, United States Geology. And, and if you look at the page after that, you'll see the actual range of, of walleyes, the native range of walleyes is all of Minnesota. And what you see on the USGA there is, isn't anywhere close to what is now stocked in the state of Minnesota as far as waters. Uh, there's a huge amount of water additional to what the native range is. So um, members, the, uh, the study is uh, uh, to Senator Eaton. Um, I don't think there's anybody that can come here and tell me that they've studied what a 54-inch muskie will do to the ecosystem. I think all the studies probably refer to 48, to right around in 48 to 50. Uh, that's quite a difference in a fish that size, what that actually does. Uh, we can argue all day long whether it eats walleyes or whether it eats sunfish or whether it eats northern pike. Quite frankly, something 54 inches in, in one of our lakes can eat whatever it darn well pleases, actually. It's going to eat whatever it wants. Um, and there's all kinds of stories, all kinds of stories of what it does. We recent, and, and we've had some recent incidents where uh, the, the lady that was here with the concerns about the potential of, of actually bites going on. In fact, there was one that was, that was confirmed up in, I, I think it was Island Lake, a couple of bites up there. And, it, you know, if, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a lakeshore owner or if I'm a resort owner, uh, I'd be concerned about that. I'd be concerned about the, the, the possibility of those, those, those fish getting to that size. So your answer is I, I don't think there's any, any study been done with anything over 48 to right around 48, 50 inches. Uh, this is a much bigger fish now that we, we've minimum amount, minimum fish that we put in, in statute about, I want to say five years ago. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I, I just don't understand why you would want to recreate the Department of Natural Resources in the University of Minnesota to regather all the data that they have and redo all the work that the scientists have done. And um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, and to think that you can do that for $50,000 is, um, I don't think, very realistic. I'm, I'm sure. Madam Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to that, 
Uh, 50,000 might not be the right answer. Uh, um, this, this uh, I don't know what the outcome of the bill is going to be, but if it's, if it's laid over, it's certainly something that we can talk about at a different time. Um, but I do know that the University of Minnesota does have some tremendous scientists. We have, a, we have what, what was introduced to me some years ago, the doctor of fish, Dr. Peter Sorensen, who, is, who has, uh, has been charged with our invasive species at, at dealing with the flying carp. And, and you all know about that, I think. We're talking about how do we stop that migration. And I think we may have come up with some pretty good answers. Some may say it, it isn't a good answer, but we've spent millions of dollars doing that research. And uh, he's, a, he's an actual renowned uh, paper writer when it comes to fish. He's the doctor of fish, if you will. Uh, and he also actually came, incidentally, to one of my committee meetings and said, I asked him point blank, I said, should any, any species, uh, any non-native species be, enter, be, uh, be introduced into the Red River uh, Basin, which includes about west central Minnesota on west to the Red River, which would include all of Ottertail County. And I didn't ask him specifically about muskie. And he said, no, nothing should be introduced. Nothing non-native should be introduced because it is a highly stressed water system. So sometimes we listen to scientists, sometimes we don't. But he would, you know, he would be somebody or somewhat equivalent to who would be doing the study. And yes, I think the deputy commissioner is right. And for some of the information would have to come from the DNR. There's no question about that as a resource. But they would be no different than any other resource you'd have for, for an unbiased study. So those are good points, and I, I happen to agree. Senator Eaton, uh, just as an aside, um, I too had a little concern about doing yet another study. But if you look at the language in this amendment that I just have been looking at, it is specific to Ottertail County. So it's not a broad study across the state. It's only specific to Ottertail. And so that may lend itself to the $50,000 being appropriate for just that county. So um, I, I just noticed that in the bill also. So, Members, are there any other questions? We do need to vote on the amendment. So all those in favor of the ICORN amendment, say aye. aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Is there any other discussion? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so, Madam Chair, I, uh, I would like to request a roll call on the, on the underlying uh, remains of the bill, the Section 7 that, that remains. And Senator Dib Dibble, we'll be laying this bill over, so oh, there is okay. no, uh, well, there's then, no roll call necessary. Madam Chair, I'd <laughs> like to speak against it then. <laughs> I think it's a bad idea. I think we've heard uh, a lot of uh, testimony um, that, uh, um, you know, we've heard a lot of, uh, conjecture and extrapolation and anecdote and fear-mongering uh, and trying to blow up single incidences uh, to, to lend to the emotionalism of this discussion. Um, I think we heard DNR tell us that they've already done quite a few studies and so uh, uh, I, I just think uh, this is this is uh, pitting uh, you know one group against another and uh, and it's just ill-advised. It's just it's bad legislation. Thank you, Senator. Are there other comments? Thank you. Hearing no further discussion, Senate File 3319 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Environment Policy Bill. Thank you, members. Thank you, all Thank of you, those Chair, who members. drove today. And I appreciate your patience at such a late hour. We are adjourned.